Good afternoon, Hawkeye Nation. It's been a long couple of days. Hopefully everybody can hear me. We've got plenty of people already in the chat, so good to see everyone there. As you can see, I'm not at my home base, uh, but that's the case every time we have Iowa Media Day and the kids open scrimmage. It's a two-day festivity uh, celebrating Hawkeye football this fall. So uh, we've got plenty to talk about. Uh, plenty of football today. I was impressed with the length of practice, and I mentioned that in my uh, YouTube short that I released earlier, that uh, recently we've had shorter and shorter spring games, and it was good to have a longer practice um, for uh, for the sake of everybody, not just the fans, but also the media. In fact, a lot of fans left early. So, uh, But again, several takeaways. I know people are concerned about Cade McNamara. We had a chance to talk with Kirk Ferentz after the practice, and uh, I'm going to be uploading that interview. I'm sure some other media outlets already uploaded that little press conference we had there at midfield, but I'll upload that as well. Uh, Kirk was asked specifically about Cade's status, and what Kirk said was they're not concerned at this point because they believe it is a soft tissue slash muscular injury, not a structural problem. Um, now, with that being said, uh, it's clear that uh, you could very easily have a serious soft tissue injury, right? But it doesn't sound like they believe it was uh, a ligament or anything like that. Um, so whether it was just a slight sprain or uh, I don't think it was a cramp, but uh, they were waiting on uh, further clarification on that as well. But I, just based on what Kirk said and then based on his demeanor, I can tell you I was standing four feet from Kirk. Uh, he did not seem concerned to me. Now, that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, there could be something there that we're going to find out about in the coming days. But let's just remember, folks, that this is football and guys are going to get banged up and guys are going to get dinged up and hurt. Obviously, Cade McNamara is asset number one for this team. is the most indispensable player on this roster, and it's not even close. Like, I don't even know who would be second. <laughs> like, if you think about it, who would be second as far as most indispensable on this entire roster? I guess that's a, that'd be a debate we could have another day. That's I don't know that we, the last time we could have said something to that extent, right? And there are some good players in this roster, but nobody as valuable to this team as Cade McNamara is and will be as we head closer to the season. And of course, uh, Joe Labus has been out since last month. Uh, he's been dealing with a soft tissue injury. It was good to hear, though. Kirk did mention after the practice today, he told us that uh, he expects Joe Labus to potentially be back next week, which would give that that quarterback room um, some good competition there right now. They're pretty thin. You've got Tommy Pahalski who's a walk on who is kind of a uh, QB number three right now. Well, QB number four, um, three, if Cade misses time. And then of course, Marco Linez is backing up Deacon Hill. At least that's how the latter part of today's practice went. I, you know, I have nothing against Deacon Hill. I hope he can, uh, if need be, and he needs to come in and, and fill the void for a time. Uh, I, I, I hope he can do that. He's got a big arm, but boy, uh, just based on the eye test folks and based on the experience and lack thereof from Deacon Hill, I, I, it was just kind of like a wake up call today. Like if you didn't realize how important Cade McNamara's health is the moment he went down, it was like, wow, like where do we go? Like wh wh where do the expectations for this season go from here? If something were to happen to Cade McNamara. I don't have the answer to that. Um, we're here to talk to you over the next hour, hour and a half. Um, well, actually, hour and a half. So at, at 6.30 p.m. Central Time, I'll be jumping off here, and we'll be recording a podcast, actually, with a good friend, Tom Kakert from HawkeyeReport.com. And uh, On3.com, of course, they've moved their site over to On3, so we're happy to team up with Tom. We'll be working a little bit more with him this fall as well. So, again, we've got about the next hour and a half to discuss what we saw today and also – what we heard yesterday from Kirk, from Brian, from the roster, um, I got a chance to talk to almost everyone I wanted to talk to. Did not get a chance to chat with Kelvin Bell, Raymond Brathwaite, John Budmeyer, or Phil Parker. And Phil's really the one. I talked to Phil last year. I really wanted to get to Phil, and it's just you have you have a limited amount of time to talk to everybody and uh, did the best we could. We can be continuing to release um, that video footage. I have seen some kickback and some reaction to the uh, 
uh, back and forth that Brian Ferentz and I had yesterday. And I, but by the way, for the record, I posted the the video. It was like about a five minute segment um, where he was answering a couple questions of mine, and there was no. Uh, I, I don't know that it presented itself that way in the video, but there was no uh, confrontational spirit or adversarial type of thing going on there between Brian and I, I just want to make that clear. Um, I thought that, you know, he, he answered the questions the way he saw fit. I'm not saying I agree with his theory or his stance on things like waste downs. Uh, I saw some people say, well, why couldn't he have named a specific person he's relied on? That's his prerogative. He doesn't want to, but I thought it was my prerogative to go ahead and ask him those questions and I thought they're valid questions, uh, given given the struggles with play calling and um, given the struggles with taking advantage of waste downs. But anyways, we won't harp on that unless people want to call in and talk about it. We can certainly discuss it. The number to call in if you want to call in by phone is 515-635-1601. 515-635-1601. Um, you can also join by means of StreamYard. I'll throw the StreamYard link up in the live chat if you want to jump on you don't have to be on video folks but you can call in basically via internet it'll ask you for your google or your or your facebook profile um, i will go ahead and throw that that uh, link up in the live chat and uh, we can just see where everybody wants to start based on a lot a lot a lot of exposure a lot of uh, a lot of access over the last two days to uh, all of the iowa media and uh, from my perspective, someone who kind of covers the team from a distance, it's always refreshing to get down there in mid-August for those these two days. And so it's tiring. They're two long days, but I've, I've enjoyed it. And uh, hopefully everybody on the channel will enjoy it as we continue to talk about it and release more and more uh, video footage. Let's get to our first caller of the day. I believe we've got Ben on the line. Ben, welcome to the show. Uh, okay, Ben's gone. Come back, Ben. If you wanted to jump on, come back. Let's get over to James, who's also been waiting. Oh, James, welcome. How you doing, Corey? Doing good, man. How are you? I'm all right. Uh, first off, I know you were talking about Kate. Obviously, probably the most important come out out of what or like thing come out of what happened. Obviously, you know, soft tissue. Isn't that what uh, Keegan had last year that he missed like the whole year with? Keegan's was hamstring related. Um, at the beginning, wasn't it? Wasn't it soft tissue at the beginning, and then he tried to play, and then it turned into hamstring, I think, or was it hamstring the whole time? If I recall, it was hamstring. But here, there, there's a lot that, and I think we talked about this in the show, uh, James. There's a lot that went into that. It wasn't just like a hamstring lingered for seven, eight months. There were things in the ways that Iowa tried to deal with that that I, I don't know worked out in their favor. I guess I can leave yeah. it at that. We, we've discussed that there were some health problems in yeah. general. I don't buy into the narrative that he didn't want to play. I know some people have pushed that, but uh, I know that's going to, that's going to scare people when they hear that Cade went down with a soft tissue injury. But I think Kirk recognizes he's basically acknowledged how important Cade McNamara is. And I just think we would have seen a different demeanor in Kirk Ferentz following the practice. If he was at all concerned. I feel like even from him too, cause like Cade didn't really look down, you know, like from what all that, Reports I seen like when he was came out the locker room, he was still happy chatting with his teammates. You know, he didn't really ever have his head down. So I feel like that you also can kind of read into that a little bit. Like people know what their body feels like, you know. And I feel like how do you know might, what? How do you know what he looked like coming out? I didn't. How did you pe see? Because people people like were posting pictures online, like Doctor Man or like that. But okay. I mean, like, but I mean, gotcha. like talking to him like that, like I see, like people were saying he was talking to people and like. Like that, like usually, if you know if you have a bad injury, you might not even ever come back out again because you know you might be too down, especially the person he is. He might come off what he did. But first off, I was gonna say, you said nobody's that impactful. I feel like the kickers, Tory Taylor and Drew Stevens, would be as impactful as that. Okay. Yeah, especially, especially with what you feel like what happened with the whole bomb. Obviously, I'm not here to talk about that, but I'm saying, well, what happened with that, especially now, Drew becomes even more than he was already. But yeah, and absolutely. I, Maybe Cooper, but from what I heard in tweets that Deshaun Lee looked good, so I don't know. Maybe maybe we might have a couple of people behind Cooper, but you know he went down last year. And you kind of see the impact it had on that. But what was the one player that stood out the most to you? Brian Allen Jr. All right. I mean, uh, I, and I was sitting next to Tom Caker at a lot of that uh, practice, and he and I both just kept marveling at how well Brian Allen Jr was playing and he just looks like a man. I mean, this is his second year in the program. Remember he enrolled early last spring. He's a name that wasn't on the depth chart pre 
pre uh, camp, but boy, he looked good and he just was tearing through everybody. Um, and of course, they're again not supposed to be hitting the quarterback. Um, I think he would have had a sack or two today had that rule not been in place. Um, he's got a chance to be really good. He's got the frame. Remember, he was a four star recruit coming out of high school in Iowa, flipped him late. Uh, got him, I should say, got him late in the process, I think on the, on signing day two years ago. So, um, yeah, he was impressive. You mentioned Deshaun Lee had two picks today. I thought the s- secondary played really well without Cooper DeGene in the game, albeit without Cade McNamara for half the practice as well. Deshaun Lee looked good. Jamar Harris, I thought, played well. Um, you're trying to read between the lines on some of these things. Uh, we saw some, I thought, some good run out of Cohen and Tringer, who is going to have a shot at getting some time at safety. We still don't know, and that's the one thing, James, I think I said this to you the other day, we still don't know for certain who's going to miss time as a result of the betting stuff. So I think it's fair to say Blom is going to miss time, whether he's completely done. He probably is done, right? That's probably... Wasn't he there there today? I heard reports he's there. I don't know if he actually was there, but... Um, He he wasn't dressed, and he went I didn't see him. Oh, okay. I don't know. I did not see him at all, and I... No. And I was on the east side. I did not see Aaron Blom. I, I doubt he was with with the team. I can tell you Noah Shannon was there. He was in the street clothes. Um, and I can tell you one question I had for Kirk post, post uh, scrimmage was where was Jeremiah Pittman? He was nowhere to be found. Thankfully, uh, Kirk reassured the media he is actually uh, at a family obligation. I guess he had a marriage in the family. So he's, you know, because my first thought, you don't see somebody right now. You're thinking, uh-oh, is this another guy who's, who's gotten hit with the gambling. Yep. And uh, first, first, well, who cares about Jeremiah Pittman? Well, they're down Noah Shannon. They were down Ontario Thompson due to injury today. They're also down um, Jeff Bowie along that defensive line. He had a, he was in a sling today and, and wasn't dressed. So they are down a few guys on that defensive line. The good news is they do have depth with Logan Lee, with Y Black, who was finally healthy, and, and uh, Aaron Graves. Maybe you throw Brian Allen in there now, too. I mean, obviously, I feel Brian Allen's one of those guys, too, who – is versatile and play both inside and outside. Like, so I feel like that maybe can help him too. But uh, one thing, you think if it was a game, you think Cade would have went back in? That's a good question. Uh, I mean, it depends like if on it was, the, if, if the it, it depends on what game, and it depends on what point in the game. I mean, if, if yeah, I, I mean, like if it was a, if it was a close game, you think he would have went back in? Well, maybe. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like wow. I, I was told today that Nico Ragaini who sat out today that he sat out and it was not a serious, not a serious injury. I mean, by the way, like, I mean, he's like, like 30. So he's earned the time to not, uh, not play in those. He's like 30. He's been to like five of them. So I think he's kind of <laughs> the right to pick and choose. And he had some issues with, with injuries last year. Remember he missed part of the season. And let's remember too, James, that they are so thin at wide receiver. And by the way, here's a guy who is going to miss time. We didn't mention this at the outset, but Jacob Bostic is going to miss time. So that's, that that is unfortunate. Uh, that was kind of revealed today, so that doesn't help them. He's one of uh, an, a few scholarship players who have any experience at all. It's a lot of pressure on Ragaini to stay healthy, on Vines to stay healthy, and the guy that was most impressive as far as a whiteout today was Seth Anderson. Um, I, I made the observation to Tom during the during the uh, scrimmage. It is clear that Seth Anderson is ahead of Caleb Brown right now. Like I know all the hype is around Caleb Brown. He's a four-star kid. Seth Anderson is ahead of him right now. And there's no question about it based on what we saw today on the field. And based on the dialogue yesterday with the players and the coaches, Seth Anderson has a chance to make an impact right away. Maybe Caleb Brown will by the end of fall camp, but he's not there yet. For sure. But I also agree with what you said the other day where he has more experience in retrospect of like he played a full year and got time at Charleston Southern where Caleb Brown, yes, he was at Ohio State, but he only had one catch, you know, and didn't play a lot. So, like, he at least has the experience where he understands what it's like to play college football, and Caleb really didn't get in that much. So that could be a little bit more of the difference. Where, like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he's got one. I mean, Caleb Brown's got one career catch. Yes, he got developed at Ohio State. You would have to think that would help him. And, yes, he was a highly uh, rated recruit. And hopefully that's like hopefully that's just an indication, James, that the wide receiver room is a little bit better at the top than maybe we've given it credit for. We haven't really seen Deontay Vines without having to deal with nagging injuries. Nico Ragini played really well when he was healthy last year. And Seth Anderson just transferred in after being really productive at the FCS level. So maybe those three guys are just going to be really good. I, I sure hope that's a problem Iowa has. 
I hope they have a problem getting Caleb Brown on the field because that's an indication that this wide receiver room has taken off. I did not see that today, but I did see Seth Anderson uh, make some plays, and I think he's a guy who's got speed enough to be a deep threat and look like he had some chemistry early on with Cade McNamara, so that was good news. I know this is just a scrimmage and a lot, and like kind of like a scrimmage and kind of like a practice. It's not really a scrimmage, more like a practice, you know. But what was one position that kind of scared you? Like, is there one player position that kind of scared you? I know it's kind of a bad thing to say, but like, some of you are a little worried about after seeing the way they look today. Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I'm still not totally sold on the line. I know there are people on Twitter ripping Nick DeYoung. I don't know why Nick DeYoung is the target from by so many fans. I know people just think the kid sucks. Um, obviously, he does not suck. He has struggled just like everybody else up front. Um, and he had a couple breakdowns today, as I'm sure several guys did. I'm not totally sold. I have to see the offensive line in an actual game against an actual defense, James, before I buy into the idea that they are that much better there was a lot of positivity around that line yesterday in conversations with Kirk with Brian with George Barnett with the the roster and then today after you know you're trying to read between the lines when Kirk was talking Dejon Parker is uh, out for a couple of days he was not dressed today um, basically everybody else played up front I think um, I know Nick Young played Dunker was in there Did Beth, was Did in, Beth there. Get in there Beth was in there Logan Jones was in there so they were pretty healthy, and they, they've got healthy competition up there. It's just so hard to tell in an open practice. The defense always dominates the offense, and that's basically what happened today. I want to make that clear. The defense won today, as they do basically every time we have an open practice. For sure. And uh, just it's going to be cool. Obviously, like I can say cool to see this year. Hopefully, we turn around. And I don't think Cage injury is that bad, but I'm not a doctor. So for me, I can't really say nothing, but I hope it's not that big of an issue, and I hope – we can get him because we're going to need him. I do feel like Deacon's one of the better backups we've had. I said this in the chat. I feel like he's one of the better backups we had in retrospect of like, maybe not, like, obviously he's not no, like, CJ Bathard, but like, recently, like, better than like Padilla or Labus is what my, maybe better than Padilla. At least I trust him a little bit more than Padilla. He's, than I do. well, so he's got a better arm than Padilla. Yeah. And I think he's, I mean, how do I put this delicately? I think he picks up things quicker than Joe Labus has. Yeah. And yeah. that's not ripping Joe Labus. I'm just yeah. saying I do think he's got the arm talent and he's got he's got the experience and the ability to he's picked things up quicker than than Joe has. And he's been here a much shorter period of time. So I would agree with you, but boy, I still don't want to see life after Cade. Because by the way, Deacon Hill, I hate to to bring this up because this is I'm not taking a shot at the kid personally. He needs to lose a little bit more weight. Um, sounds like he came into Iowa and he was like 270, 280 when he got he here. At, he was listed at uh, the depth chart, the first one they had for the thing. He was listed at 263. Yeah, I think he needs to. Yeah, he needs to lose some weight. Um, that, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a trainer. I'm not a coach. But you know, that's that's going to hamper him. I would think. Um, what was Nate Stanley listed at, James? Do you remember? I. Uh, to and he was he was like 242 it wasn't it was never 260 he was like 242 50 yeah. but he also was like he, he put on a lot of muscle there because he wasn't always that big i don't think but i think he put on a lot of muscle after you got to like his years i think more of it was a little bit was fat but i think it was more muscle too because he did put on a lot more muscle it seemed like when he got the longer he got at iowa or the longer yeah. he was at iowa yeah so i think he needs to lose some weight he's got a better arm than maybe those guys you just mentioned earlier but uh you just hope that Cade can stay healthy. I mean, the, the the success of the offense largely hinges on the offensive line and on Cade. Even though we want to talk about wide receiver, um, they can they can survive. Like in 2015, they went 12 and 0 with subpar receiver play. Like their receiver play in 2015 was Tavon Smith, Jacob Hillier, Riley McCarron, and Matt Vandenberg. Like those guys were okay but not exceptional. Um, if they can get okay wide receiver play with solid line play uh, and a quarterback that knows what he's doing, they're going to be pretty good with this defense. For sure. Yeah. What was one takeaway? What like, was one takeaway you had before I get off? Like the biggest takeaway you have from the day? Uh, biggest takeaway is Cade's is, Kate uh, health status is really important. <laughs> I think I think we kind of knew that coming into it too, but now that he's a little banged up or a little dinged up, I think you realize it even more than you already realized it in retrospect. Yeah, yeah that, that's what I would say. Uh, like I said, Brian Allen looked really good. Deshaun Lee looked really good. 
and Seth Anderson. I, I think Seth Anderson was the, the, the best surprise. And early he made some plays with Kate on the field. Um, now, Kirk did say this was probably his best practice so far. Um, and remember, he missed spring due to injury. So, you know, maybe this is, you know, you're going to have highs and lows. And certain guys that didn't play well today may play, you know, in two days when they practice. But uh, I would say those three guys impressed me. And, and overall, yeah, you like you said, kicker, quarterback, punter, health is really important at those three positions. Yeah, but uh, I get off and let somebody else. Uh, call you don't want to take up the time. What I what channel are you on for the caker one? Um, I'd have to ask that's his podcast, so I, I'm not sure um, when he's going to be posting that. Um, uh, James, but it'll maybe be tomorrow, later this evening or tomorrow. Right, I'll try good. to tweet that out, I'll, I'll retweet it when it when it drops. All right, sounds good. Enjoy it. Thanks, James. All right, folks, uh, we've got uh, I believe Ben and Tom on hold. Connor, thank you for the compliment. I've uh, been trying to put out as much content as I can uh, while also trying to uh, pay steady attention to the actual football. And uh, the last two days have just been filled with action. I know some people in the media would prefer to have Kids Day, the open practice, and Media Day separate weeks because you you bunch them together. And then it's like the shelf life for Media Day is so thin compared to so short compared to Kids Day. Uh, you have a one day turnaround. It'd be nice to kind of spread that content out. But on the other hand, for someone like me, who's, you know, I'm two hours and 10 minutes away from Iowa city. I like being able to just get away for a couple of days. All right, folks going to take a quick break. And uh, as a thank you to our sponsor, we'll be right back with more of your phone calls talking about Iowa and kids day media day, Iowa football, just around the corner. From the Man Cave Kinnick Under the Kitchen, authentic, original player art prints are being drawn up for Hawkeye fans everywhere. From Under the Kitchen's Murray Legacy print, which features former Hawkeye Kenyon Murray, current Hawkeye Chris Murray, and current Sacramento King Keegan Murray, to football players Lucas Van Ness, Tori Taylor, and Cooper DeGene, to wrestlers Tony Cassiope, Alex Marinelli, and Real Woods. Oh, and only one of the greatest athletes to ever compete at Iowa, Spencer Lee. There are so many options available and they make great gifts. Visit Under the Kitchen on Facebook or at Under the Kitchen's new website. It's underthekitchen.square.site. That's underthekitchen.square.site. Check out Under the Kitchen today and get your authentic, original Hawkeye print. Yes, thank you to, to Randy and uh, Under the Kitchen. He's been with us for uh, well over a year. He's actually going to have a stand at Fry Fest. So if you haven't checked out Randy's great work, you can check him out online or visit their Facebook page. But check him out at Fry Fest. Give his stand a visit. Purchase some prints. Tell him from the Hawkeye of the Storm sent you. Again, Under the Kitchen, Randy Engel over at Fry Fest. That's on September 1st, folks. So the day before the season opener, which is on the 2nd. Again, Fry Fest on September 1st. All right, let's add Ben. I think we've got Ben back. Let's see if we got Ben. Ben, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Good to hear from you, Ben. How are you? I'm good. So um, I was just wondering uh, about Nick Jackson, why he uh, he's just behind Jay Higgins on the depth chart. Oh, I'm behind Jay Higgins on the depth chart. Uh, I haven't looked at the depth chart. In a few. What's the depth chart say? Uh, Jay Higgins is the first string and then Nick Jackson second, so. I, I wouldn't read into that. Uh, whether whether Nick Jackson's at uh, whether he's at the uh, Mike or at the uh, Leo, he's going to play. You're going to see a lot of Higgins and Jackson on the field at the same time. So I would read into that depth chart. I mean, one thing I brought out yesterday after Media Day is Nick uh, Nick DeYoung was listed as. Uh, he was listed at left guard and it sounds like he's not been working out at, at left guard at all. He's been exclusively at right guard and at right tackle. So I wouldn't read much into the depth chart at this point, Nick Jackson and, and Jay Higgins are your top two linebackers. And after that, it's probably Kyler Fisher and without Carson Shire, who's also banged up right now. I don't know who else. Well, um, what's your biggest defensive like takeaway? Uh, defensive line is is going to be really good, and once they get Noah Shannon back and Ontario Thompson back, um, you know, and Jeremiah Pittman back, uh, they're going to be even better. They're just so deep. Uh, mm -hmm. I've said this before. Ya Black is one of the biggest football players I've seen in person, and that's not exaggeration at all. He is huge, biggest guy on the team. I don't think it's really even close. Um, and you know, he's been healthy. 
he struggled with health throughout his career and now he's finally healthy. So that is an indication to me that maybe, maybe he can get that light to flip on here before September and Aaron Graves, having made the jump he has, you've got experience in Logan Lee and Noah Shannon. They're just going to be really solid up there, and that's going to make things a lot easier on the back end. So do you think that Rusty and Dejan will, will be starting come this fall? Um, I don't know. I, I don't know about either one. Um, I, 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 that's, you know, I'd be guessing. In fact, it's a good question, Ben, because I had this. As we were talking to Kirk after the, the scrimmage. I'm thinking to myself, yeah, who's the starting five? And, of course, you're not going to ask Kirk that three weeks out from the season. But Richmond's cemented at left tackle. Logan Jones is cemented as your center. And Jennings Dunker got a lot of run at right tackle, but it was Dejon Parker was out. Now, Kirk did bring up the fact that Dejon missed a lot of time in the spring, just like Seth Anderson did. So he's been playing catch up. And usually when Kirk Ferentz uses that term catch up and he's not talking about French fries, he's talking about a guy who's actually behind and is going to have a hard time fighting his way back as compared to, to a guy like Jennings Dunker, who apparently has been relatively healthy all year. So my guess is if you had to make me guess right now, Richmond at left, Logan at center, at, at right tackle, you're going to have uh, Dunker starting. Um, hopefully Parker's a, a guy who can rotate in. And then the other two guard spots, uh, yeah, a mix between, you know, the young, and Feth, along with, uh, who am I missing? Tyler Ellsbury would be in the mix there. Um, am I missing someone? I know I'm missing someone else. Uh, I can't even think of who else I'm missing at this point. But yeah, uh, th those are the guys. I mean, um, but I think you, you're, you're likely going to see those three guys, and then the, the two guard spots will be up to up to uh, competition towards the end. That's How my did guess. How did Caleb Brown do at the um, the open practice uh, uh, today? I mean, he's running a lot with the twos. Um, there was one ball that was thrown his way. I believe it was from Cade, I believe. I'd have to go back. I'm pretty sure it was from Cade. It was intended for Caleb Brown. It was picked off by Jamari Harris. Um, great play by Jamari. And, yeah, I mean, I, I, I didn't see anything from – this does not mean he's not going to start or he's not going to make an impact, but I didn't see anything from Caleb Brown today that made me think, wow, this guy's going to come in and be wide receiver one. Like I know a lot of people think that because of his pedigree and his background uh, in the fanfare, but I, I didn't see a whole lot from him today, Ben, um, but he's got, he's got several more weeks. He just got here. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Good call from Ben. Appreciate that. Uh, we've got a couple more callers here waiting on hold. We've got the phone line open, folks, if you want to call in 515-635-1601. Let's go to Tom, who's been waiting on hold. Tom, welcome back. Good to see you. Good to see you, hey, Tom. Hey, uh, just real quick. I don't know that you know what a waist down is. Do you know what a waist down is? Uh, that's up for debate. I guess that's up for debate. Let, let, let me say something before you go uh, into that, and, and I'm happy to, to address that, but there, there were a couple comments in the chat or in the, in the comment section of that video that I've seen. It, I haven't got a chance to look at them really closely since I posted that video late last night. One thing I'll give Brian credit for is he is right. Not every third and one is a waste down. And I want to make that clear. I am not professing that every time it's third and one, that's a waste down. It does depend on situation, but I, someone else made the comment in the chat and they're right. When you see over and over and over again a pattern of not really even attempting to take advantage of second and one, second and two, second and three, third and one, that is an indication that you don't really value waste downs or you don't understand what waste downs are. And based on Brian's dialogue, it's kind of a mix of both. They don't really believe in taking risk, even though waste downs, that's the whole point of a waste down is it's a low risk, high reward situation. Um I, that's all I can, That's the only way I can explain it. Next time I get Don Patterson on the show, I'm going to have him talk on it. Sounds like his waist down to third and 13. <sighs> yeah, I, I mean, again, what he says makes sense at, to a point, to a point. Um, I, I do feel like there's, uh, I don't want to say filibustering, that sounds bad, but... He does give about the longest answers. He's obviously very smart. Yeah, no one's ever questioned Brian Ferentz's intelligence, but uh, I, I 
yeah, they're, they're, I, I don't agree with his philosophy, but I'm also not a coach. So that's why I, I lean on Don Patterson so much. Don Patterson so much. All right, Corey, I'm going to let you go, but appreciate it and appreciate listening about today. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> appreciate Tom. I just wanted to call in about the, uh, the Brian Ferentz interview. Um, yeah, that was fun. Maybe we can, uh, maybe we, for anybody who's missed that, we can, we can plug that here in a few minutes. And again, if you have not seen it, just so people know what we're talking about, let me, uh, let me see if I can pull that up here. Yeah, I got it here. So we can, we can play that here in a couple of minutes. Um, I'm kind of behind in the chat, so stay tuned, uh, uh, hang tight folks. Let's go to our next caller who is on hold. Welcome to the show. Hello. Hello. The B. Hello. Hey, how are you doing? Good. Who's this? Brandon. Hey, Brandon. How are you? Good. Checking in from Idaho. So always, uh, still have to stay true to my Hawks, uh, and excited to see that you did uh, give some reports from there. I really enjoy your show. Um, Thank you. A couple questions. What's with Terrell Washington Jr.? Was he on the field at all today? I believe so. Um, and what position do they have him in? I think he's still listed as a back. Uh, they. Uh, it looked to me early on, I and mean, I let I me mean, make sure that he was uh, – Look at my notes here. I'm pretty sure he was out there. Isn't he number eight? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He was out there. He was out there. Um, they lined him out. They flanked him out as a receiver a couple of times when they were actually going um, 11 on 11. I think, uh, don't quote me on this, but I think they, he was running a lot with the the threes at the end with Pahalski and those guys. I think, um, you know, his problem, I, in my opinion, his problem right now, having not really seen him a whole lot in the spring is he is still very raw, still very young, even though he enrolled early. And he's got three really good running backs ahead of him. And Kamari Moulton looked really good when he played today, true freshman who just got here a little over a month ago. So there's some competition there. If they deal with more injury at receiver, I, I would not rule out the idea of, of them running him at receiver more once we hit the season. I don't know how much he's been working there, but he is supposed to kind of be that versatile slot type of guy. So, but he was out there today. I can confirm that. And then also is, is there any chance we're ever going to see um, Slinsky at all? <laughs> what, what, what's with this guy? Um, it, it, it even, at, are they going to even maybe put him at guard or something? Just get him out there. Or I always see him in a lot of pictures. He does a lot of events. He goes to a lot of things. He just seems to be there, but is he there? Like, is this guy dressing at all? What's the deal well, with him? Just, I'm not. I'm just. I'm just curious, Brandon. Why you? Why are you specifically asking about him? Well, I remember he was such a huge get at the end. Uh, like it was. It was like a big deal to get this kid, and he had a lot of offers. And so it was like you know he was supposed to be the next heir apparent, you know, behind Linderbaum. And then it, he got hurt. Obviously, we understand that he went through a cycle of some injuries, but then it just seemed to. He got behind. He never, never got to that point, and he still stuck around the program, which is a little surprising to me. So I was just curious: was he dressed? Did he play it all today? Did you see any of him? Would, do they play him a guard even at this point, or is he strictly just going to be a center dude, and, and we're never going to see him? I, I, and I'd have to again. Uh, there's so many people you're trying to take note of today. I think he was out there because he's he's number fifty three. I think he was running third team center, and they've got. Uh, Tyler Ellsbury to kind of taking backup snaps behind Logan Jones. The only way I can explain that Brandon is kind of what you said. He's dealt with injuries and that always hurts you, especially when you're an offensive lineman. And he came in expected, expecting to be a center. And like you said, there was this transition period with Linderbaum and Linderbaum was such a freak. They, they moved Logan Jones over. And I, I really do think uh, that's one thing that I am convinced of. Logan Jones is going to have a really good year. So that doesn't necessarily bode well for Michael Mlislinski getting on the field. And there are so many guys that they've been working at guard. I just think, you know, maybe I'm totally wrong on, on the differences between, between playing center and guard. But my guess is he would be so far behind if they started to run him at either left or right guard. And he'd have so much competition in front of him. They'd rather him become a steady center so that, if and when something happens to Logan Jones or Jones, you know, ends up being really, really good this year and heads to the league. Hey, we can, we can, uh, we've got an error apparent there. I don't know if Tyler Ellsbury is the long-term answer as center. 
Um, he's also ran some at guard. So I, I don't know. I mean, this always happens with linemen. It happened with, um, it happened with the kid from, uh, from Norwalk, uh, whose name escapes me right now. Uh, you, you probably know who I'm talking about, but uh, the four star from Norwalk, a lot of hype around him. Tyler Endress, Tyler yeah, Endress, a lot of hype around him and graduated, never played. So wow. that it does happen. I hope that's not the case with Michael, but I just haven't heard a whole lot other than he was hurt much of last year. All right. All right. Love your show, Corey. Where, Brandon, you know. where are you at in Idaho? Uh, Northern Idaho, the very, very tip close to the Canadian border. Okay. Cause I used so, to have family and I used to have family in post falls. Oh, well, yeah, I'm more North of that, but yeah, okay. I'm familiar with that area. So yeah, we got, there's a lot of actually a lot of uh big 10, uh, crew that hangs out up here so we always uh love watching the hawks and now we really love watching your show and stuff and, and really getting all the info, beautiful so. uh take a visit to beautiful lake Coeur d'Alene for me i missed that place we were just there last week yeah That's yeah awesome. it's beautiful it's just gorgeous gorgeous weather we had some, you know what they had some fires out here that was kind of weird kind of a little strange at this time usually it comes a little later but but uh we got through it and uh yeah it's summer's still kicking it's just now you can smell the fall in the air so Yep. Of course, it's ready for the pigskin. There you go. Well, be be safe, Brandon, and we'll talk to you during the season. You got it. Take care. Thank you, sir. All right. Um, yeah, I see some comments in the chat about who would be the second most valuable guy behind Cade McNamara. Well, Cade, maybe. But they're not real deep at cornerback, although the last two days, that is one position I feel a little bit better at having watched them today and and having talked to the coaches yesterday and the other players Deshaun Lee looks the part right now on the football field that's good news Jamari Harris I'm rooting for that kid he's went through a lot some of it I, I know he had the OWI arrest um and I actually brought that up to him I did um and I asked him yesterday I'll post this video at some point this month I asked him you know the injury last year the arrest you know does that kind of humble you and and make you more equipped for adversity adversity and he he said yeah i mean he, he feels like that's he feels like uh the struggles he's been through his entire life have made him stronger and and that is i mean that's kind of a fact of life when you deal with stuff like that um how you respond really determines who you are and how successful you'll be in whatever you're doing whatever craft you're a part of so i'm, I'm rooting for jamari harris and i've had Deshaun lee on this show he was a late ad in the 22 class and so uh, he hasn't been around that long. We had a really good bowl prep last December. Um, and with the guys now uh, in front of him, like TJ Hall, assuming TJ Hall's in front of him, Cooper DeGene, Jamar Harris, all three of those guys have had some injury issues at, at some point in their young careers. So you never know. Cornerback seems to always be a position where they deal with plenty of injuries. So we'll just have to wait and see. All right, let's go to our next caller. Thank you for calling Hawkeye Hangout here from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Who's on the line? Bronco. Bronco. Yo, I want hey. to talk about Brian Ferentz. Okay. So I watched the uh, interview with him that you posted up on YouTube. Okay. And uh, you know how, like, if you had all your primary colors out, you jumped in yellow, and you mixed it with some with some blue, you'd get green, red and, and blue make purple. But if you mix all your colors together, it just becomes like brown mud. And the more that he talked, the more I felt like what he was talking about just became brown mud. I mean, he, you know, I think you bring up a great point, which is second and one with an offense like ours is a perfect time to take a shot. And all of a sudden, uh, three minutes down the road in the interview, he's talking about, well, maybe third and 15 is a great time for us to take a shot. Or first and 10 is a great time for us to take a shot. And I got to tell you, by the time that he got done talking, uh, I felt like I had a little less confidence in him than I already had. Uh, and then at the end of the interview, it was just so weird because I just felt like he became a little bit condescending toward you. Like the, it was such an awkward moment where he made the comment about, have I ever dropped a name before? Um, I'm sure if we had the time and the tape available, we could go back and find him talking about experiences in other programs or situations or with coaches. So did you feel awkward um, <laughs> at the end of that when he answered you? Not really. I mean, 
um, I, I know a, a, I had a couple of people who watched that later. Uh, and, and my family had one uh, guy who was working with me at the, at the event and he kind of overheard the whole thing. I, I didn't feel awkward. Um, but I, I can, I have had a couple of people who have said they thought it was kind of condescending how he talked. I'll say this to give him the benefit of the doubt. I, I, something, I, I think he sometimes comes across that way and I don't think he intends to. Um, now that doesn't mean that I agree with what he said, the, the substance of what he said. And I still think he has the tendency either uh, on purpose or, or accidentally of filibustering when he, when he's asked a question that should be relatively simple. Um, and I appreciate his thoughtful answers, but uh, I, I don't agree. I, I agree with what you said. Uh, I, I don't understand how it, with as, as much as the offense struggles and he talks about ball control and uh, limiting risk. That's again, that's the whole purpose of a waste down. Is, is that uh, you can right. finally take a shot and to an extent, to an extent, there is no risk. I mean, there's always risk with everything you do, right? Um, sure. But uh, would you rather have second and down, to t- second and one to take a shot or would you rather run the ball for two yards, have first and 10, and if you make, if you uh, throw an incompletion down the field, now you're at second and 10, you're behind the chains. Um, I'm not going to stand there and argue with, with the offensive coordinator in Iowa. I will say that uh, somebody on our uh, on the channel made a comment uh, this morning how they thought that waist downs were just something that uh, casual fans who wear their baseball caps backwards talk about. And um, I find that funny because we have had a number of conversations on this show with Coach Patterson. And I know there's some people that don't like Coach Patterson because he speaks his mind and he speaks the truth. That's fine. But uh, waist downs are a real thing. And when Brian Ferentz dropped the Bill Belichick name, um, he, he was acknowledging the fact that, that Bill Belichick believes in waist downs. So, you know, Bill Belichick, <laughs> I think it's fair to say he's probably one of the most successful NFL coaches in the history of the league. Um, you know, whether you credit him or you credit the quarterback, he had most of his time there in New England. Um I, I didn't agree with the answer, and I can understand where you're coming from. I didn't feel insulted by Brian, if that's what you're asking. Do you feel uh, – do you guys interact very often? Like, is it easy for you when you go to these media days? I don't know. Are you ever in the, uh, like, the post-game pressers? Not since they moved him on Zoom. Or, excuse me, not not since they moved him away from Zoom. I was able to be in a lot of the – well, not the post-game stuff, but I was, like, a year or two years ago, whatever it was, when they were all on Zoom. Um, especially the, the Tuesday and Wednesday uh, media availabilities. I, I tried to take part in those as much as possible. And the whole reason I asked him the waist down question was because I had been able to ask him that question following South Dakota state last year. And like I said, in that little exchange with Brian yesterday, when I asked Brian a year ago, Hey, why didn't you take advantage of more waist downs against South Dakota state? His response is, well, Corey, I didn't really feel like we had waist downs to take advantage of. And at the time I'm like, okay, well that kind of makes sense. But then when you look back at the data, and you see that you can basically count on one hand how many times during the 12-game season that Iowa actually attempted to take advantage of a waste down. That tells me it had nothing to do with the number of waste downs you had because this is one of the worst offenses in the country, and they still had plenty of opportunities to throw the football downfield in short yardage, early down situations. So uh, I wish that I could be a part of more, and maybe they'll make – I haven't really talked to communications much about this, but – We'll see how much they make available on Zoom, but now with the, with COVID kind of being a thing of the past in many people's minds, I, I my my guess is there's going to be limited access to Zoom, and I'm not going to drive. It's not going to. It's not feasible for me to drive two hours every Tuesday for press conferences. Uh, you know, it, it's 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 um, one thing I, I I do feel like a lot of the time when when Kirk as well, although I'm 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 much more appreciative. I guess, or respectful or just getting the thousand mile view of what Kirk means to the program. And I, I get frustrated over his defense and denial sometimes, but like his body of work. And there's a lot of times that I'm extremely proud of how he's run his program. But um, sometimes like what I feel like is lacking is the data, like the hard numbers. I mean, he was, 
at the Big Ten media days and I was watching an interview where he was still talking about how he thought Spencer had done a great job for them and that they didn't support him quite enough. And sometimes in some of his post-game press conferences, I would just think like, I wish we had a data analyst to show them when, you know, X player is on the field versus Y player, or when you pass uh, occasionally on first down, what does this mean for your offensive output throughout the game? Like, Sometimes I feel like maybe maybe they don't go back and and like have a number cruncher uh, that looks at at the data. But I want to end just by asking because I feel like you have this unique window. Do you feel like with reporters and media in Iowa that there's a fear sometimes to ask certain questions in a post game for fear of like not being invited back or or it being harder to get back into the next? Uh, press conference or does that not really exist? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I don't know that anybody in the Iowa media would admit to that. Um, and I'm not around them on a weekly basis to really know. I know, you know, two, two days in the year, you know, when I get down there for media day, I'm able to be around them all. And everybody that I've had conversations with have been very, uh, very welcoming and very, uh, kind to me, I guess is, is the best way to describe it. But I think there is some natural, there has to be some natural uh, wherewithal and understanding and self awareness, if that makes sense, that you, you can't push the issue too far. And and I, maybe that's just my personality. Not that I'm saying I tried to, pu- I ever try to push the issue with Brian or Kirk. Um, and there have been Iowa media members who have pushed issues with Brian and with Kirk and with Fran McCaffrey and different people. But I do think it is a, there is a sense of, you have to, you have to think about one's own survival in the industry. So I don't know that I would be revoking credentials, but I don't think anybody wants to dance on that line. And that's not from anything, uh, any conversations I've had, that's just me surmising that based on kind of common sense and and what I observe. I'm not, when when I go to media day once a year, I'm not afraid, you know, I'm going to press Brian a little bit, which I, did you feel like I really pressed him on during that little exchange yesterday? No, I actually feel a lot of the time like I wish that you were in the press, the post game pressers, because I feel like you ask fair and thoughtful questions. And I didn't view it as a ribbing. You didn't take a shot. Like that's a legitimate uh, football question. I appreciate that. You know? Yeah, I appreciate that. I'm not there to rip it. But uh, yeah, there could be a sense of that, I think. I'm not saying fear, but uh, an awareness that there could be some pushback. Um, if, if you ask a question that's taken the wrong way, or you challenge somebody on their answer, um, and, and that's all I was doing yesterday is when, when Brian answered the first question and he, and he took about three or four minutes to answer it, I just wanted to re-ask the question because I didn't feel like we had directly answered it. Do you, do you, and then the question of course was, do you feel like waste downs are something that needed to be addressed during the off season? Is it something that needs to be examined heading into the season and you know when he answered the question about who who do i who who does he uh, consult with who has he leaned on for play calling help he didn't name anybody specifically and that's why i went back to it and said can you give me someone specific and that's when he he said no so yeah i i don't have any fear in doing that and i'm not sure there's people in the media that have fear of doing it either but my guess is there is an understanding that uh, you can only go so far Ultimately, those guys have to be around that football facility literally how many weeks out of the year, and it's their livelihood. So I, I get it. Well, I've called your show three times, and every single time I wind up coming down on Brian. One of these days I want to talk about something else, but it just seems like every single time I go to call your show, I see something that makes me a little just irritated and that answer that that answer did because I just felt like by the end of his answer he was essentially saying well a waist down could be any down and it's whenever we feel like it if we feel like it at all and maybe not and, and, and here, here, here's the other you know? thing I mean I, I had somebody say well he probably knows you've been critical of him I don't think Brian's watching my show I don't think he's taking the time to watch or listen to other podcasts maybe he does here or there but I mean these guys are pretty darn busy. I'm pretty sure that Brian doesn't know me from Joe Blow. So I just think that's sometimes how he comes across, even if it's unintentional. Um, he gives very thoughtful answers. And sometimes the way he comes off could seem condescending. Like I said, I, I, 
it would be hard for me to take something like that personally. Um, but I understand, and I watched that back after I posted it, and I, I can understand why somebody, they see these this this five-minute clip, why they may think it was sort of an awkward situation, but it is what it is. Well, I do want to say one of the cool things about your show, uh, I found it about a year ago, but it really does feel like uh, I got, I got uh, exposed to it at the beginning of something. And I don't, I don't know, I don't know that you've ever talked about it, but it feels like, uh, it feels like there's a lot more viewers every time and uh, that there's a, a bigger community uh, discussing what you're doing. And you're just, you're extremely good at what you do. You, you just inherently ask, I feel like the types average fan wants to know and you're discussing the the things that we want to know about and so uh, i just really appreciate it and uh, if you ever have some some time i would love to hear you address like how, how is the channel doing is it growing a lot and, and um, all that stuff so I thank you very much that. Corey. i appreciate it thank you very much i appreciate that yeah good questions i appreciate the phone call uh as far as the channel is concerned yeah we, i can certainly uh give kind of a, an update on the channel as a whole, maybe publish a, a video on that at some point. This is such a busy time of the year. And when you're juggling, trying to, to manage uh, sponsorships and you're, you know, that's our sponsors are the lifeblood of this show. So I do appreciate everybody, uh, including under the kitchen who's sponsoring this segment, Iowa floor covering. We're going to see a, a message from them here in a few minutes, but I do appreciate our, our caller, the compliments and, uh, yeah, uh, would like the, the channel to continue to grow. Uh, it's going to slow down just naturally. It's going to slow down in the off season, but now we're heading into busy season, mid August, or yeah, mid August now. And then, of course, things are going to get really busy once you hit late fall with basketball starting and women's basketball is going to be big. And we've got lots of stuff coming down the road. So uh, I do appreciate the support. Thank you very much for that. Um, Erica says she's not as optimistic as she was before. Barbara says, according to reporters, Kane went down when he was scrambling, not from anyone hitting him. So I went back and watched this after, and I see the the question here from Jared as well. I watched every play during the practice today, and I was on the east side of the stands. There was one play where he kind of got banged around a little bit, unintentionally, but it was on a pass rush. But apparently that was not the moment when he got hurt because then I saw later somebody posted on Twitter um, the video of him scrambling and then kind of falling down and then he got right back up and looked fine but ended up going to the locker room in fact some other media person walked over and said hey you see that uh, uh, Cade went to the locker room and we hadn't seen that uh, so yeah I, I, I yeah, it was kind of a wake up call to me. If if you didn't already realize it, how important he is. I I just I, I have a feeling at some point. I'm not trying to I'm not trying to get anybody negative. I think we're going to see at some point uh, somebody else behind center. I'm not saying that it's that Cade's going to go down with a, with the uh, terrible injury, but it's so hard to stay healthy, uh, guys. It's it's very hard to play basically every snap of a season and they're going to be games. There's no question going to be games like Iowa should be able to take care of business against Utah state to a point where they should be able to put in a backup in garbage time. But I'm talking about significant time. I would say given Cade's injury history and just given the game of football, there's a decent chance that someone else is going to take significant snaps at quarterback. So th that's why it's so important that they get Joe Labus back here in the next couple of days it was good to see Deacon Hill get extended run. And I was kind of thinking that today. I was thinking, man, Hill is running with the ones. He's running with the twos. And I'm talking about after Cade went down, why not give Marco Linez a look? And then I'm thinking to myself, you know, I think the coaches are making a good decision there because, um, you know, Cade's their guy, right? We know Cade's their guy. But if something happens to Cade, it's not going to be Marco Linez unless Deacon Hill somehow gets hurt. It's going to be Hill. So put your eggs in that basket for now. Linez's time will come. He'll get an opportunity to get those snaps, to get those reps and get better. But I'm, I'm glad. I think it was a good decision on the coaching staff's part to, to get Deacon Hill extended run today. And he sure did with Cade McNamara out. He looked the part at times. Like I say, he's got a good arm, not the most mobile in the world. Um, did throw a pick or two, I think. 
Um, but uh, we'll just see. I, I would not push the panic button on Cade yet based on the language from Kirk. Erica, thank you for the super chat. How did the running backs do today? Haven't seen anything about them. Um, thought they looked okay. I, I, I mean, nothing blew off the chart for me. Um, you know, your top two, I think right now is clearly Caleb Johnson and Leshawn Williams. I know Kirk Ferentz mentioned yesterday during his media availability that uh, Leshawn is playing as well as he has uh, ever in an Iowa jersey. So that's an indication that you're going to see a, a two-headed attack for sure. I know people are really high on K uh, Caleb because he is um, a physical specimen. He's a big dude. He's cut. But uh, LaShawn is a, a is more than capable as a Big Ten back. So you're going to see both of those guys. Jazz Patterson played a little bit late today. I think they're comfortable with those three guys. And like I said, Kamari Moulton, I know it was late and it was against the third string defense. Moulton looked good, powered through a couple of tacklers, um, uh, scored a touchdown late through contact. He impressed me as a true freshman. And again, he did not enroll early. He just got there as well. So that was impressive to me. Um, and and yes, Terrell Washington's also on the roster. And am I missing someone else? Max White is a, a walk-on who's on the roster as well. Um, the good news there is they're healthy because that's another position that can easily uh, be disrupted by camp injuries. And so far, so good um, on that front. Looks like all three of the top three backs are healthy at this point. All right, let's get back over to our phone line. Jeff, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I was uh, at the scrimmage today for practice and uh, impressed by a lot of things. Uh, I think the secondary has a solid two deep after watching today. Some of those guys that were question marks maybe going into camp uh, really shined, and I would say that's at all levels. Um, and it was interesting because both into the defensive backfield and wide receiver and even at, at the linebacker positions, defensive line, it seemed like they really rotated a lot of combinations in with the ones. Uh, but you didn't really see that as much with the offensive line. Um, it was pretty much the starting five and then Rusty Fett in there at, uh, at guard uh, mixed in there. So just wondering if they were trying to create some cohesion up front there. And I thought Mason Richmond looked fantastic at, at left tackle. Um, really looks like he's going to be a solid starter there. But uh, I think they're still struggling to find that right tackle. Um, Dunker, I think, is a nice prospect, but I, I really think he's more of an inside guy. Um, I know they had Colby out there at the beginning of his career, and he's moved more inside. And Colby seems like he's maybe a little better with his feet than Dunker is in terms of the pass pro is where Dunker really struggled. Uh, again today and hopefully they can get that cleaned up because it did look like Cade was was late on a lot of things and I don't know if that was because of a not a clean pocket or if it was you know just receivers not working themselves open or just you know maybe going through his progression so it's a little tough to tell without knowing and that's one thing I think I, and be interesting to hear Don's take on this on how programs go into an open practice knowing that you know there's more eyes there anybody in the crowd can be filming this and and seeing this and sending it to other programs and things like that. So I think they're a little more guarded. You didn't see as much motion shifting. The route combos weren't, you know, they're not running route combos to try to get people open. There's a lot of one-on-one, -on -one, try to beat your man type of matchup. So that lends itself to the defense uh, having an advantage inherently because you're not going to run that stuff and show your hand in, in an open practice situation. But uh, those were some takeaways uh, on my end. I just kind of yeah. want to know your thoughts. Yeah, Jeff, I, I agree with what you just said. And and based on what Kirk said yesterday, Colby um, is exclusively on the inside. So, I, I I mean, I you could be right about his feet, but it, it sounds like they're committed. I was committed to running him on the inside for whatever reason. Um, I, I do. I, I still think that if Dejon Parker, it's unfortunate he missed time. Keep in mind, he was out today. So, right. Even though he's maybe behind. Uh, from a schematic standpoint, uh, behind a guy like Dunker or Nick DeYoung, who's also going to he's getting some time at right tackle while Parker's out. If he can get up to speed in three weeks, um, he's got really good feet. That's one thing that Don Patterson has pointed out when he's watched Parker on tape. He's got really good feet um, for a guy his size. And by the way, had a conversation with Dejan yesterday. Super, super dude. Like I'm, he's another guy I'm just really rooting for. Such a nice, genuine guy. Really appreciative of the, of the opportunity he has here at Iowa. 
So um, hopefully that's uh, hopefully that's that's going to happen, and him coming back will help the competition at, at right tackle. It's just hard. It is hard for me. Maybe you paid more attention to it than I did, Jeff. But it's hard for me to evaluate the O line against the Iowa defense. Either way, like even if the offensive line had looked that much better today, I'd still have to see it against an actual opponent. Um, and again, we're only, I mean, they've had eight practices. This was practice number nine. So some of these guys like Rusty Feth wasn't even here in the spring. Dejon Parker didn't really practice in the springs hurt right now. So hopefully in the next three weeks, we see a jump from some of those guys that struggled today. Yeah. I, I think it's a little bit of a situation where they, they, they just, the footwork's not there. And I think with Richmond, He's had the footwork since day one. Um, he just was a little light in his loafers coming out. Now he he's the size of a Big Ten lineman. Jennings Dunker's the size of a Big Ten lineman. It's just I don't know how much you can really correct that footwork, and that's where DeYoung struggled, and that's why they're trying him inside. I think they like DeYoung and uh, his strength, and he's you know I think they got some road grader size guys. It's just that pass pro on that right tackle side. I think you know developing some depth there to be able to. Keep a clean, clean pocket for for uh, the quarterback and stuff. And let's, um, let's keep this in mind too, Jeff. And this is I mean, I'm not breaking any news to you, but uh, obviously we've seen the struggles with pass protection in recent years, especially with an immobile guy like Petrus. Not only is Cade not real mobile, he's more mobile than Spencer, but he's still not a real mobile quarterback. The other factor that we have to remember in all this is how valuable he is his availability is. So not only do you want to protect him so that you can make plays through the air, but you want to protect him physically because believe me, um, Iowa state and, and Wisconsin and Minnesota and these teams, I will be facing these fronts that I will be facing during the season. They're not going to be holding up like the Iowa D line was today. And Agreed. He's, going to take, he's going to take some hits and you're right. If that right tackle spot is susceptible uh, and he gets, you know, hit blindside a couple of times, you never know. He could be out just like that. So, uh, it's, it's important that they figure out that position for a number of reasons. Yeah, and I think, you know, they they mixed some guys in. It was it would have been nice seeing Carson Shaw or uh, who else is depth behind linebacker look like. The, the Rex Roth kid was in the Knicks, that Knicks linebacker in on the inside. Him and, and Harrell were both rotating in there with uh, a little bit with the ones and, and definitely with the twos. That's another position where, you know, we've got two, two essentially new guys in terms of uh, – big time playing experience for, for the Hawks anyway, um, that are in the mix there and, and knowing that defense and just keeping, uh, keeping depth in that room, but everywhere else, uh, boy, it looks like a nice solid two deep kicking game looks great. Uh, and all that stuff. Uh, okay. one other, one other, Oh, go ahead. I was just like, Kelby Tellender played a little bit too at linebacker. Once they get Shire back, he'll, he'll work back in. And I, I don't know how serious his, his injury is, but uh, they need to get him back. Uh, they got a lot of young talent. You mentioned Harold, who's not real young anymore. He's what a, a third year guy, I believe. Yeah. Um, but you know, guys like Jaden Montgomery, uh, he played a little bit today, but he's a, a true sophomore. Ben Keeter's a true freshman who's got a, a lot of upside. Aiden Hall, I know the the program people around the program really like him. Landon Van Ke- uh, Kekarex, he's also a, a second year guy. So you're right about that. Uh, that's one thing Kirk mentioned yesterday. Depth at linebacker is still a work in progress. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, this is one question kind of related um, to some of the Brian Ferentz interview stuff and, and whether he listens to the show or uh, that type of thing or gets feedback. Um, one thing I've always found interesting um, and I appreciate coach Patterson's candor, but um, it also sounds like he's kind of got an open door to the program and a friendship with Kirk. You know, I just, I, I wonder how that's thought of because he, while he is, he is a uh, very, you know, he, he can be critical of, of the, the coaching at times, which again, as a fan, you appreciate that, that candor, but at the same time, you know, how is that seen within the program? And I kind of get the same feeling like from Chuck Long as well. Like, I, I don't know if these guys maybe got passed over for some positions and, and they're kind of like, they're able to just say, well, this is how I feel, but then they still have that open door with the program. I mean, do, do you think that these guys, these guys are human too, that some of that gets back to them that, you know, you've got, uh, you know, a former coach that, you know, had coached with these guys, two former coaches. I know Chuck is not a regular on this program, but he's on some of the other programs and podcasts I listen to. But, you know, them being critical um, of, of, of coaching decisions, you know, and again, as a fan, you appreciate that. But, you know, does that get back to the coaching staff? That'd be interesting to, to hear and, and to know. Uh, 
I know that from that I standpoint, know that, I, I know that uh, Don has had people within the program say, hey, "I heard you on on this show." He actually does another show, a radio show around Iowa City. He's he's had people come up to him from within the program that said, "Hey, I heard you on such and such a show." D- Don's not afraid of of that. And and here's one thing, Jeff, that I appreciate about Don. Don can be critical, but Don is also respectful, and I, I think Kirk respects that. Listen, Don meets with Kirk every single week. They go into the office. They sit down together every single week. Don still works his tail off throughout the summer to get analytics ready for the season ahead. And Kirk takes the time. They have a good relationship, a good friendship. They take the time every single week to sit down and go through these analytics. Now, whether or not Kirk is using those analytics on game day, I guess that's up for debate. And, you know, Don doesn't. He provides those to them as a service, as a courtesy and a service to them. And, and of course, what they choose to do with it is their their decisions and their prerogative. But, no, I, I think there. I think Don's relationship with Kirk is very strong. Um, I, I can tell you that I, I asked the question to Brian yesterday about who he's consulted with because, by all accounts, and I've asked Don this, uh, and I'd like, ask him again. I have no problem with that, but I don't really think Brian's consulted Don. And one would think, like, I know some people have made the comment, "Oh, Don's, you know, he's old and washed up. He, he's seventy-one years old. He's like six years older than Kirk." He coached explosive offenses under uh, Hayden Fry, the most successful coach in Western Illinois history. He learned with some from with some of the best offensive coaches in Iowa and Big Ten history. Like, wouldn't you think he's right in the he's right in Iowa's backyard? Wouldn't you think maybe it would make sense for Brian Ferentz to lean on a guy like that who wants to help you? Like, I, I would agree, and, and you know, I, I don't have any problem whatsoever with a guy like Don Patterson or Chuck Long being critical. I guess, you know, there's a, I have a coaching background, and and one of the things, you know, as as a coach in, in that fraternity and stuff is, you know, it, it, I think it's okay to be critical behind closed doors, but I think you kind of get the fan base stirred up when you come on a, you know, on a podcast, and you and you kind of make it public, and I I just don't know if that's breaking the code a little bit with those guys, and. And if that's maybe a little bitterness of being passed over for some opportunities in, in the program. Uh, Don, um, has, Don has not lobbied. I can tell you, Don has not lobbied for any, any opportunities. Um, so, you know, he's, he's been very outspoken about, he was, he was a, a candidate back in 99 to be the head coach. Um, right. And I ended up going with Kirk and uh, Chuck Long was on that list as well. Guy from you and I was on the list. Bob Stoops was on that list, but uh, Don loves this university. And, you know, Don's a big boy. He's an adult. He, he can, he can decide whether he's pushing the envelope or not. Uh, I can tell you he is very, a very thoughtful person. So um, he, he cares about relationships. He cares about friendships, but he also values transparency and, and honesty. And he is not a part of the program anymore. He pays, he, he pays for season tickets like everyone else. So he is not only a former coach and, and an Iowa guy, but he's also a fan and he cares about Iowa football. He's a former coach. So he's a great mind. So, you know, he, he, he makes those decisions. Right. No, I was just, I was kind of curious on that. Of, yeah. of, I guess no, I always thought up with it because yeah. just, you know, just the criticalness. And, and like I said, I think you'd be surprised at some of the stuff that, that gets back to, to coaching stabs. And sure. now you've heard Brian even reference that his neighbor, he drinks beer with on his back porch, you know, tells him this, that, or other thing on something he heard, you know, whether he takes that with a grain of salt or not, but um, you know, it's out there. So they're aware. Um, and having been in a circle similar, you, you, you're more aware than, than maybe people think you are. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Jeff. I, I appreciate your call, sir, and, and please call back when we get Don on and, of course, during the season for post game. All right. Thanks, Corey. Thank you, sir. All right, folks, we've got a couple more callers here on hold. We need to, to try to get this thing wrapped up in the next 15 minutes. I do want to share the interview. Is that okay? We keep, we keep talking about it. It keeps getting, getting brought up. So why don't we do that? And if you've missed the interview or if you've seen the interview already, just stand by because I know there's 185 people on right now, and I'm sure not everyone here has watched the uh, the uh, few minutes with Brian Ferentz uh, from yesterday. And it's not, by the way, it's not the full cut up of Brian, but uh, it was the the short dialogue that I had with Brian yesterday, and I asked him about waist downs, and I asked him about uh, who he's relied on over the years uh, with play calling. 
And uh, yeah, here's here's what Brian had to say. Um, why didn't you take advantage of more waste downs against South Dakota State? And your response to me was, well, I didn't feel like we had many waste downs. Mm-hmm. As the season progressed, uh, and by my count, you guys attempted to take advantage of approximately five waste downs all year. Is that something you look back at and say, we got to be a little bit more opportunistic with? Or what's your approach with waste downs? Could you give me your definition of a waste down? My definition would be second and one, two or three, or third and one. Obviously, that's up for debate, right? I I would have a hard time ever seeing third and one as a waste down. Okay. Um, if, If I could phrase the answer this way, I think if you think philosophically about offensive football and then if you think philosophically about offensive football and how it fits into team football, or at least the team football that we're trying to play, you know, our job is very simple. If you look at how we're built defensively, probably easier way to flip this on its head. Um, Look at us statistically, look at what we do very well. Our defense always is going to be tops in points per game, right? So their focus is on limiting points, right? Now start moving down the line the next thing they're worried about right is field position and possessing the football right so like our defense isn't necessarily going out there just trying to get the ball right back they're trying to limit points they want to limit the offense from advancing the ball right and then turnovers they happen right they happen but we're not always out there just trying to create them and we get a lot right but it's not because we're running buddy ryan or rex ryan stuff you know i remember in the nfl um like Rex Ryan, brilliant guy, really good defense. And there were some statistics that they were always going to be top 10, but points wasn't always one of them. Uh, when it was, they were very successful. But they had a different philosophy. They, they were about attacking, and they were about trying to take the ball away. So now you got to look at us as a team and say, okay, well, if those are our priorities, then, then you got to flip that on its head a little bit, right, offensively. So first and foremost, our job is to possess the football. We have to have the football, okay? Whether it's turnovers, right, or drives or whatever, we want to possess it. Then we need to advance it. Then we need to score it. So what I'm saying is on waste downs, just always refer back to the model. If it's third and one, right, possession, advancing or scoring, all risk reward, right? That's what I'm getting at. And sometimes second and one to second and three are going to fall into those. Now, you may take a shot on first and 10. You may take a shot on third and 12, depending on the field position, right? But when you are trying to advance the ball in those chunks, it's it's just, for for me, and I'm not saying it's right, it's never as simple as, hey, it's just second and one, and we can throw this one away, and whatever happens doesn't matter. Every time you put a play in the game, what happens matters critically. It doesn't mean that you don't take chances or you don't push the ball downfield, right? Or you don't try to advance it in chunks, but you have to be very um, cognizant of when and why you're doing it. I know that's a long meandering answer. So that answer your question? It it does. And I guess to sum it up, you don't, you're not, you haven't, that's not been something that you're looking at or you've examined specifically. Waste downs have not been something No, but I've heard a plenty of defensive guys say second and one shot down. Sure. Right. Like that's a I, Bill Belichick talks about that all the time. Yeah. Right. And I think some people philosophically perhaps call plays that way. We don't. That, that's all I would say. Now, we're going to send the ball. We're going to take shots. We're going to do those things. Um, but if, if this makes sense, right, like sometimes your absolute best opportunity to do it might actually be third and 13. Right. Because you can guarantee a certain coverage. You can guarantee a certain matchup. You can guarantee a certain look. Uh, that's when it's time to take your shot. Maybe it is second and one because you know you're going to get something or they're going to do – maybe it's a certain field position. You know, maybe it's the plus 19. Maybe it's the minus 35, depending on what's going on. Um, I guess what I would say is, like, the way we would look at it is there's just a little bit more to it than down a distance. Sure. And, and final and question. clock and score. Yeah, it's, sure, definitely. It's a simple game. Yeah. That can become complicated. Are there people – and you've been asked this, I'm sure, in the past, but are there people specifically – over the years that you've been here as the OC that you've leaned on to better yourself as a play caller. I mean, there's so many great people that have come through this program, either as coaches or players that have become great coaches, people or people in the NFL that you've connected with. Mm-hmm. Who have you specifically leaned on to learn more about play calling and advance that craft? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of people, right? There's people I worked with. Uh, there's people I learned under. 
uh, that you stay in contact with, that you touch base with. Uh, and then one thing you have to do in the off season is get out and, and talk to people, whether it's on the phone, whether it's going and visit people. Um, and there's plenty of examples. You, you talk to guys in college football. Uh, you guys, you talk to guys in pro football. You talk to guys on all levels of college football. You talk to guys in high school. You talk to as many football coaches as you can uh, and just talk football. And, and that's the goal. Are there specific people that, that you really leaned on over the I mean, years? I, or? I don't, how long have you covered us? Uh, well, I've been doing this podcast for about two years. Yeah. Have you ever heard me drop a name? Uh, probably not. It's on yeah, precedent. Not about to. Okay. All right. All right, so so that is uh, the Brian Ferentz segment that people are uh, summoning or uh, mentioning in their comments. So uh, if you hadn't checked that out, it's over on YouTube. But uh, we'll post the uh, post the rest of the time with Brian. We got a little bit more footage than just that, but uh, again, you you determine what you want to determine based on that uh, interview. Let's go to our next caller. Actually, before we go to our next caller, folks, I'm going to get people's thoughts on on that. I see that the, the chat's pouring in. I um, want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, Ascent Nutrition. Uh, I don't want to forget about Ascent. They've been with us a long, long time as well. Certainly give them a chance. If you've not browsed their awesome products, do so. Visit GoAscentNutrition.com. They've got this new Agaricon mushroom powder as, as well as their Lion's Mane mushroom. Both of these products can help support your memory, focus, respiratory health, as well as your overall immune system. Now, the military and government's research into Agaricon specifically has shown how its rare compounds exert strong biological activity and through traditional use as well as science up to date, Agaricon has been used to support respiratory and lung health, along with immune system health, neurological health, and it promotes a healthy inflammatory response. You can read all about it here on the website. You can also read about their lion's mane mushroom. Mix these mushroom powders into yogurt, juices, smoothies, cereals, granola, and other foods quite easily. They're a great complement to the mic and fulvic acid or even the algae oil DHA. And how about the uh, premium organic mold and mycotoxin-free coffee that I've talked about at length. About, uh, visit their website, browse their many products. It's goascentnutrition.com and start your ascent today. All right, let's go back to the phone lines. Lomansky, I believe, is on the phone. Welcome to the show. Hello. This is Lomansky. Lomansky. How you doing, sir? I'm good. Thanks for your uh, dedication the last two days. I'm sure it's long days for you. Absolutely. I enjoyed it. Uh, you've been on the show a long time. I've got to eliminate half what I wanted to ask you and, and drive down into the uh, basically compliment the Iowa fan base. The Illinois game is the only game not sold out. And I went on the official website and looked where the seats were available and uh, what a tribute to the Iowa fan base. I think they're pretty excited about this year. I just wanted to say that it's one of the program and it's going to make a difference at home. You know, I was, if you go to Iowa, which I did the first two years, you take a lot of undergrad courses and it's rhetoric and writing courses and communication. After your uh, interview with Brian, I went to other assistant coaches. I went back to when Kirk was hired and listened to how long he talks, how he listens. And he had to answer a very difficult question about Bobby Stoops, you know, because that was a hot button when that was, when he was hired. And he did an excellent job of handling it. It was a short answer. Some talk too long on your show, Corey. And I'm very cognizant of that. But when you interviewed Brian, he asked you several questions. He doesn't understand the context like his father does. Like, look at, look at Kirk when you were around after the, the scrimmage ended. All those reporters around, he had concise, short answers. And you can, you can disagree with me. You can comment on that. You know, there's a lot of questions he's got to get in in a short time. He's not as flamboyant as Hayden, and he's, he's a different personality. But the more he gets close to the end of his career, he doesn't have to be like Hayden because he still is a teacher. And, and Brian really made a mistake with you because he doesn't understand why he's there. Parker does, and a lot of those great assistants do. And he asks you two questions that are unnecessary. And... I would never ask Don Patterson how long he's been uh, 
doing the media thing outside of coaching, I wouldn't ask you, you know, how long you've done your podcast. That's kind of asserting like he's wrestling you for control of the interview. His Corey, his job is to information the fan base, appreciate the fan base, appreciate the media, and there's a big gap between him and the assistant coaches. I I compliment you how you are always respectful. I've never seen any of your questions get in the ditches and just keep doing what you're doing. Uh, I, I just wish somebody in the Iowa program, even Beth, say, you know, Brian, you're, you're a good enough guy. Here's what you need to do to communicate is shorten your answers. Just like, well, has got to shorten my answers or my verbiage talking to you and, and let you talk more, Corey. But, <laughs> but, but you should feel really good about, what you're doing. And I could care less if I hear, I, I wish they wouldn't hear of you, Brian, anymore. You know, well, it's just, it's not a good look for the Iowa football program. So, so I didn't take offense to the question of how long have you been doing this? And by the way, I said, I told him two years, two years of doing the post game show. I've been podcasting and, and, and I've done radio longer than that, but that goes without saying, we don't need to talk about that, but I, I didn't feel insulted by the question. Again, I, I don't know that Brian intends to come off the way a lot of fans feel like he comes off, if that makes sense. Do you, you get what I'm saying, Lemansky? I don't know that he means to sound condescending, if that makes sense. He does. You think he does? You think he does mean to sound condescending? The fan base interprets it that way. That matters. Oh, sure. I'm it matters. Sure somebody I agree. Yeah. Chef says Loma or Lomansky talk less and let Corey talk more. I'm sure they think that, and they're right. But at least yeah. I know it. Well, I'll say this: uh, Brian has a totally different personality uh, than Kirk. Um, I think Brian, uh, based on what I know, he 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 is more like his mom. That's what I've been told. At least I don't know Mary, but I mean you know, kind of has that fiery personality and, and where Kirk can be fiery. He is kind of more of the, uh, the lower tone, like you said, concise, uh, answer of questions, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I, again, I, I, I was not thrilled by the answers. I'll say this. I was, I walked away from that short little discussion, not down in the dumps about everything and think, Oh, well, you know, woe is this team and this, you know, this team doesn't stand a chance. I have not had high hopes for this squad because of Brian at any point during the last eight months. My my optimism, I think a lot of fans' optimism regarding this football team has been surrounding personnel, surrounding the quarterback position, surrounding Phil Parker's unit. And you just, I've said this before, maybe that's coming down too strong on Brian, but I have kind of just hoped that Brian would kind of stay away from Cade. Just, just let him do his thing. Um, Maybe that's going too far, but uh, that's kind of how I feel at this point. But at the same time, like you said, Lemansky, my number one priority when I'm at, talking to Brian or whoever is I want to be respectful. They've given me access to be able to, just like they gave everybody else. I mean, a bunch of people at Media Day yesterday, they gave all of us access. So I appreciate that. But there's nothing wrong with asking pointed questions. I don't think I'll ever be a head coach. And my primary reason for saying that is he doesn't do off the field not even half as good as Hayden Fried does or Don Patterson does or, or Kirk Ferentz does or Iowa won the Jewel Moore Award, was awarded in December of 2016, and Brian had a lot to do with that, and I respect that. This is a great litmus test because he's still in the room, and Iowa's runner-up the year before. We're talking competing against Alabama and Georgia top tier programs. If they can, can't get those guys to work together, which is more important, it says if you read the Joe Moore Award stuff, than having a great athlete. Sometimes you can put five guys together that can work together. If that doesn't get done this year, because what Brian told you at that interview is they're risk averse. And I understand that. Special teams and defense is what we're good at. We're not good offensively. So you stress those other two parts as as frustrated as the fan base is, and Don Patterson's right, we don't attack the whole field. And he's right, I wish we we would, but that's what we can judge them on this year about 
that offensive line has to be able to run the ball and that would make our passing game better. I can't, uh, I, I can't disagree with that. Um, the the risk adverse strategy offensively has not been working, and I think it's almost an it's almost a way of implying that uh, that sort of a mindset offensively has helped the defense succeed. And I'm not sure that again that was the that's the intention when Brian makes comments like he he does. But I think what people don't what, what he well, maybe hopefully he realizes that if the offense gets better, the defense gets better. Like. I'm not saying that, like, obviously, the numbers-wise, stats-wise, maybe that's not the case because maybe they're not going to have as many opportunities at turnovers and big plays, but that's going to keep that defense fresher, keep them off the field more, put them in better positions, less uh, less adversarial positions, less uh, compromising positions on the field. So I, I agree. I, I agree with everything you said, Lemansky, and uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I I, I uh, yeah, I don't know what else to say on it. This year, we've got something to look at and talk about because with Hayden Fry, his third year, when when he started beating the likes of UCLA and Nebraska, he introduced the, the upright tight end. And we have a rich tight end tradition. Now we've got two tight ends. This scheme, well, if you listen to Kirk, we've got three, four tight ends. We should be able to protect the quarter with tight, protect the quarterback with tight end formations. We should increase our pass game with two in, two good tight ends with options. I'm sure uh, Don Patterson is going to talk about that because that's the strength of the offense. It's got to be schemed up. I'll, I'll get off here because you've been here a while, Corey. Keep doing what you're doing. And just so you know, this communication I talk about, he comes off in your interview differently than the other assistant coach. Look, and I'll, I'll end with this. If you go back and listen to that interview, Corey, because you were doing it, go back again and look at his face. And I was taught the University of Iowa undergrad is nonverbal. He's got lines in his forehead bulging out because he knows he has to ask a question. His mouth is an upside down view. He's almost grimacing. Then when he talks, he relaxes. Kirk doesn't do anything like that. Kirk is the same way all the time. And you can't tell what's going on with his nonverbal. I'll I'll end with that, and I really appreciate what you do for Iowa football. Thank you, Lemansky. Appreciate your call as always. Yeah, I, I appreciate that comment, and I didn't want this to turn into a <laughs> again a Brian Fair a Brian Ferentz uh, knock fest. South Bend Hawkeye says, "Corey, you're protecting him just like Kirk Ferentz protects Petrus." Stop. <laughs> okay, I apologize. I'm not trying to protect uh, anybody. I'm just trying to be fair. Uh, Tony, thank you for the comment. Uh, what was your th- what were your thoughts on tight end usage today? Seemed a little underutilized to me. It'd be a, certainly a, a position they'll they'll use to target. Yeah, they're they're comfortable with four guys and maybe five. That's one thing Abdul Hodge said yesterday. Is Johnny Pascuzzi, who's uh, a walk on and has has got some experience now under his belt. I think he's they're comfortable with all five guys, especially the top four though with Stilianos, Estringa, and the top two being Lachey and all. All in Lachey are NFL guys. The offense will be as good as the tight end room. Um, I shouldn't say the offense will be as good as tight end room it can be, but uh, the tight end room has an opportunity to elevate this offense. And rarely could you say that say that about a program. Very rarely could you say that a tight end room could make such a difference with an offense. But I was one of the few offenses nationally. I think it could and it will and it has in the past. Go back to 2018, uh, 2017. Great tight end play. They were not great offensively. Their numbers were most definitely helped, though, by strong tight end play. And I think that's if they can keep Cade McNamara healthy this year, that that will be the case. Do I think Cade will miss week one? No reason to think that at this point. Um, no no reason to, to uh, think that at this point, based on the commentary from uh, from Kirk Ferentz. Uh, I think I answered this, uh, Erica. Hopefully I I. Didn't miss it. South Bend Hawkeye, is it true that Petrus suited up, had a great practice? No, he, he did not. I think there's some sarcasm there. Tyler says, did you record any of the practice like you did for spring? If so, will you be posting it on your channel? Yes and yes. Highlights coming, folks. Stick right here from the Hawkeye of the Storm. That is coming. How did Deacon Hill look? Extended run. He had his ups and downs. Good arm. 
I agree with the caller earlier. I think they're in a better position with the backup quarterback position now than they were a year ago, but still, Cade McNamara's health is really important. Brian says, did Feth play with the ones? Maybe a little bit, but he was mostly with the twos, but they are getting good competition from Feth and seven or eight guys, and that's positive. South Bend Hawkeye did not talk to Spencer, was not part of media day yesterday. Did not, I would have had no problem. would have loved to talk to him about what he's learned at the uh, offensive line position. Apparently, he's helping coach right now. Brad Jackson is Tommy Pahalski, a legacy. Yes, son of uh, former Iowa quarterback Tom Pahalski back in the 80s, who was a letterman at Iowa. Steve, it's Cooper to Gene OK. Heard he got dinged up. Did not suit up today, Steve. Um, based on everything I've been told, not real serious. Um, he should be back, I would think within the next week. ZJ, any more players than the ones being reported or being looked at for the illegal betting stuff? Um, I've heard a couple other names, not going to drop them here. We'll see. And Kirk, you know, they, they just don't know where this is going to head. I don't think there's going to be more criminal violations, but there could be some NCAA for infractions coming down. Again, you just have to think that those are going to come from the NCAA soon. Shane, were there any true freshmen that are obviously going to be in the mix? I think Ben Keeter is going to play on special teams. Would be surprised if he doesn't. Um, I, I think Aiden Hall and or Zach Lutmer have a chance maybe at playing on special teams. I think one of the receivers, I'm talking about either Alex Moda, Dayton Howard, or Jarrett Bowie. One of those guys has a chance to play a little bit on offense. Um, other true freshman first-year guy, I mean, Ontario Thompson's not a freshman. I think he's got a chance to play along that defensive line. Um, after that, yeah, I don't know. I'd have to think, give that some thought. You never know. Kamari Moulton looked good at, at times. That's a position they've struggled to stay healthy at in the past. Takoon says, uh, how did the O-line look? Again, fine at times, hard to read uh, inside the lines, at least for me, up front. Um, maybe Don Patterson would be would have a better breakdown. I know he wasn't there today. I saw the, the question from Erica here. Was he at the scrimmage? He was not. Uh, he was not at the scrimmage today. Had another obligation. Appreciate that super chat, Erica. Uh, but I'm sure he'll watch as much footage. That's another reason why I wanted to get footage so Don could watch it back. Uh, Chad, is Marco redshirting? I'm guessing that's the plan. But as of right now, with Cade being out for at least right now, Marco's number two. So uh, he's got to be available as of right now. Hopefully they get Labus back, and hopefully they get Cade back very soon. Hawkeye fan, um, another season of Brian Ferentz. Haters gathered to talk nonsense. Brian explained today his approach to the offense. Corey doesn't like like it. Was Corey a football player? <laughs> okay. Uh, th this guy has been in the chat so many times, and I have explained so many times that my number one goal when I come on the show is to be fair and to be respectful. And if you don't like it, you don't take personal shots. That's fine. All right. I'm not a, I was not a college football player. If that, if that makes you happy, I will admit that I did not play college football. So uh, anyways, I don't believe that means that uh, a person who doesn't play college football can't still give fair criticism. And another big part of this is that's why I've acknowledged the reason why I need to rely on Don Patterson, why I think we as a fan base need to appreciate people like Don. And uh, our caller earlier, Jeff, brought up Chuck Long. I know Chuck doesn't really do a ton. He's got some obligations with Big Ten Network. He's the CEO of Iowa Games. But people like Don... Uh, they really care about this program and they understand football better than any of us here on this show. You in the chat, myself included. That's why he's such an asset to Iowa and such an asset to this show. And we'll have him back for post game coverage this year. But uh, anyways, that's a different, uh, I guess a different discussion. Hawkeye Howard, how the fullback look. I really didn't notice. I wasn't paying attention to Hayden large today. I thought uh, yesterday I asked Kirk the question. I said, Hey, can you, do you think Hayden large can get low enough as a fullback? He thinks he can, but he struggled at times. Uh, because of his height at six foot five, but they're going to use the fullback Hawkeye Howard. And uh, again, I guess not having noticed it a lot today would indicate that he probably did just fine. Cole stipulate any of the younger freshman receivers get any run. Bowie had a couple of catches. I did not see Moda out there. He was suited up, did not see him in the game. I don't think Dayton Howard got a run as well. Number 20, kind of an interesting, he's got the number 20 as a receiver and he's like six foot five, looks like a tight end, but he's got a chance, got the physical upside. Sam, Corey, did you feel like Brian was attacking your credibility? I didn't, but I know some people, you know, I'm not saying he was. I I, I didn't take it personally. I know some people did. Lomansky, uh, Joel Klatt recently, very complimentary about our fans. And Kinnick then said Oregon game day similar. Keep up the good work, Hawkeye Nation. Thank you, Lomansky, and thank you to everybody for being here. Eric is our last caller of the day. This is going to be real quick because I'm late for a, a podcast with 
Tom Cakert. Erica, sorry to just get to you now. How are you? I'm good. How are you? How are you? I'm doing okay. Good. Um, so I just wanted to jump on since you started talking about Brian Ferentz and what he said to you when you asked him that question. I believe you asked him yesterday, right? Yes. Yep. So his answer to me, that's part of the problem of, you know, Iowa not becoming more of a force within the college football world is that every time we're asked or we talk about offense, it always somehow magically turns into a discussion about defense or special teams. So it's like, we're just totally avoiding the question um, especially if it's Brian who's being asked the question. And I think that it's a real shame because we could be, you know, we could be championship contenders if we had a good offense. And that's just a fact. So I just think it goes back to they're okay with the status quo. Um, they don't want to, they're not interested, I guess. Well, maybe not, in, maybe not, not interested, but they're not concerned enough to take an active interest in improving anything. They just want to stick to the same old, same old, and we keep getting left behind because of it. And I just don't understand the fans who defend Brian endlessly, like this Hawkeye fan person that you just put his chat up. I don't understand those fans because, like, are they just content constantly being, you know, having eight and nine win seasons, which I'm not saying that's bad. Eight and nine wins isn't bad. We've talked about this before. There's a lot of teams that would want that type of, of uh, team that constantly gets eight and nine wins. But what's wrong with wanting more? Like with the attitude Brian has, we're never going to get anymore. We're never going to get anywhere until he's no longer offensive coordinator. And I would even go as far to say, unfortunately, we probably won't go anywhere different with Kirk as head coach. And that's not, you know, dumping on Kirk because I've already talked about the respect they have for Kirk. But that's just a fact. That's how he plays his offense. And I know he's not the offensive coordinator, but that's heavily influenced by Kirk. We all know that. So I just I'm trying to understand why some fans just aren't interested in doing better. I, I sympathize with you completely, Erica, and uh, I don't know. I wish I had a good answer for you. Um, hit me up on our next show um, because I'm, I've run out of time here, but um, I appreciate your passion. I appreciate your support and don't get too down right now. I know that there's, you know, there's been some, there, there's obviously still people who are unhappy with the situation with, with Brian Ferentz, but we're three weeks away from a season with, some personnel changes that could pay huge dividends and a very favorable schedule. So keep your head up because there, there is reason to believe this team can accomplish great things this year, regardless of who's coaching the offense. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, I'm not completely Debbie Downer here. I mean, I need to see how they do on the field before I pass judgment on that. It's just my opinion, since we're talking about Brian, part of the reason we don't get any better is because of his attitude. He's just not willing to change. It's stubbornness. And then the way he makes us look with the media, it's just like, it's no surprise that we have a you know certain reputation about being off, yeah. not an offensive team. So it's just a little frustrating, but no, I mean, that being said, I'm excited. I'm really excited about Seth Anderson. I knew, I just, I don't know why, but I knew he would do well with us. And so I'm excited to see him develop. Hopefully all the guys who are hurt come back to the field quickly, especially Cade for obvious reasons. And yeah. I would love to see Marco get a chance to play this year. I think it would be awesome. Like you were saying, if, there's teams where we're really taking care of business and we're leading them by like three touchdowns or something. They could bring in Marco and Deacon Hill to improve. That would be fantastic to see. Marco can play four up to four games and then, and still, uh, and still redshirt. So that could happen. Yeah. And it would be good to build depth. You know, that's always sure. a good thing. Absolutely. Well, anyway, I'll let you go. I know you have to thank leave, but yeah, I would love you, to Eric. talk about that in a future stream as to why are we stuck with this per perpetual like oh eight or nine games is good enough for iowa why are we stuck there i think that's a whole topic that you could do a whole show on yeah we we, we will uh, have plenty of opportunities we'll have a call-in show here we've got brad heinrichs coming on the show here in a, a couple of weeks we'll have plenty of opportunity yeah i'd love to hear coaches take on it too oh, we'll get it <laughs> well thank, thank you very you, much have a good evening appreciate it you too all right and brian uh, if, the, real quick brian welcome to the show hey what's up man um so I just want to get I just want to get information what's going on with Iowa man because uh, I'm a Cade fan and I just want to know like I, I haven't been keeping up with Iowa. Um, I expect them to actually you know hopefully improve on offense. So what so what, what updates you got? Well, he went down with injury. To, he went down with a soft tissue injury today. Hopefully uh, he's okay. The coaching staff's not real concerned right now, but uh, his health is of utmost importance, and I think Iowa fans have pretty darn high expectations for. For him, and I know he was surrounded by immense talent up there in Ann Arbor, but uh, compared to recent quarterback play at Iowa, you can see why Iowa fans are so excited, but they got to keep him healthy. I think he's a perfect quarterback for what you guys run there. Um, you know, he makes good decisions. Uh, yeah. he, I mean, I think he's perfect. At, um, yeah, no, I think who, who do you guys play uh, on the east on the east side? 
We uh, I was at Penn State. They get Rutgers and they get Michigan State at home. Okay. Pretty favorable. Avoid Michigan. Yeah, that is, that is that is pretty favorable. Um, do you have any thoughts? I know this isn't an Iowa question. Do you have any thoughts on the news that came out today about the Michigan suspension? I, I didn't even see it. I've been so locked into Iowa. What was the news? So uh, Harbaugh's not getting suspended, I guess. Now I, they oh. they the, it fell out. I don't know. I guess Michigan told him to you know kick rocks, and now he's not even getting suspended for at least this season. It might carry on in the next season, but at this point. Um, it looks like it might be the first school to be, you know, pretty much be like, Hey, you guys can kick rocks. Right. Yeah. So I don't uh, know. Not see that. Uh, that I find that interesting. That'll, uh, do you, I don't know if you want, do you watch the show with Mark, Mark Rogers? When I, when I get time. So I do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'll be anxious to get his thoughts on that. I, I did not see that, but, uh, that surprises me. I assumed he was going to be out for what? Three games. Oh, it's supposed to be four, four games. Yeah. Now, now he's not even getting suspended. Um, so, what is your prediction record-wise for Iowa? I haven't made that yet. Um, I, I've said this on the record. I think the the floor is eight and four if Cade stays healthy, and the ceiling is eleven and one if 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 he's uh, if he's healthy. Yeah. Uh, if he's healthy, I got him going eleven and one. I got a shot. The, the the schedule's favorable. I got a shot. Um, no guarantees, but like I say, I think the floor is eight and eight wins at this point based on personnel, assuming. Again, no, nothing happens drastic as far as injury. All right, well, that's all I got, man. Have a good one. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate the call, sir. And, Doug, uh, how good is Utah State? We don't start 3-0. and It'd be kind of a disappointing one to be kind of disappointing to lose, right? Sorry for the dumb question, basketball guy. Thank you for the super chat, Doug. Uh, I don't know much about Utah State last year. Better question for Mark. I need to start doing some digging on Utah State. We'll try to get a media member on for our weekly show with Mark coming up on Tuesday. But uh, Iowa should be 3-0, especially with the problems at Iowa State. Nope. Travel two aims this year, assuming Kate's healthy. Iowa should be heavy, heavily heavy favorites, even on the road at Iowa State, coming off a year where they lost the Cyhawk Trophy. All right, folks, thank you uh, to all for being here. And I know the conversation ended up going to Brian, but lots to be positive about over the last two days. I'm a lot higher on the offensive line. If you missed my breakdown or my reaction from Media Day, check that out on the channel as well. Lots of coverage to come, folks. Again, keep it locked right here. Throughout the month ahead, please subscribe if you've not done so. You can donate by means of the description as well. Hit that like button on the way out. It does help. We'll talk to you next time right here from the Hawkeye of the Storm.